Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Zaidah. This program is supported by the Center for Security, Strategy and Policy Research. A word about CESPA. It's an autonomous policy research center housed in the University of Lahore. And it tackles issues that impact contemporary security and strategic developments. And this program is part of that effort. Now, while President John F. Kennedy was debating the best course of action during the 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, ultimately ordering a quarantine of Cuba which showed resolve without unnecessary escalation, and this is when diplomacy was also going on, something else was happening underwater. A Soviet B-59 submarine, which was out of contact with its superior command, was in the waters. The U.S. naval ships, having realized the sub's presence, began dropping depth charges to force the sub to the surface. The submarine's captain, Valentin Savitsky, and the other senior officer decided to launch the only nuclear-tipped 10KT torpedo. The sub's executive officer, Vesely Akhipov, did not agree. And since the launch was based on the three-person rule, his nod was important. He prevailed upon the other officers by arguing that the U.S. ships were only forcing the sub to surface. The sub ultimately did surface and headed back without being intercepted by the U.S. destroyers. The point is simple. Regardless of the JFK's XCOM discussions and whether to respond to Khrushchev's hard or soft letter, if the Soviet sub had indeed fired that torpedo, the situation would have most likely escalated, possibly to the point of no return. So even if we were to accept that both JFK and Khrushchev merely threw the toys out of the pram and ultimately settled for a resolution because of deterrence, the Soviet sub could have upset the entire balance. So what's the corollary here? With nuclear weapons around, a lot depends on luck, even as deterrence rests on the assumption of rational choice. So as we witness increased conflict around the globe and the nuclear weapon states modernizing their arsenals, and frankly, as I've previously been doing programs on this, the you know, arms control, bilateral and multilateral frameworks essentially unraveling, it's important to revisit the concept of deterrence. And I have just the right scholar with me to discuss this, Dr. Jeffrey Knopf. Dr. Knopf is a professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, where he serves as chair of the MA program in non-proliferation and terrorism studies. Dr. Knopf is also a research affiliate with the Middlebury Institute's James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies and Stanford University's Center on International Security and Cooperation. Jeff, thank you so much for being on the program. I was really looking forward to it and apologies. Last time we had scheduled the program, I <laughs> went under the weather, so we had to postpone it, but it's great to uh, have you on the program. Um, so here's what I suggest. Uh, obviously, there are technicalities involved in all this, and you've written extensively on this, but I would like to sort of keep it, uh, you know, I will. We can't exactly eschew the technicalities, but just for informed generalists uh, through various examples. Uh, and uh, I was reading your uh, one of your uh, chapters, which you've submitted. It's still to be published. And I was chuckling to myself because, you know, I started as a deterrence optimist and now I call <laughs> myself a deterrence skeptic. And there was a lot in that chapter, which was obviously uh, very close to my heart. So uh, let's begin with the idea of, you know, I mean, we have created a club, frankly, and clubs have a certain way of developing their jargon. Clubs also have a certain way of basically creating a worldview. But frankly, even within the nuclear strategy club, there are strategies and there are strategies so you know there's no real consensus there let's start with that and see how the story unfolds sure well thank you very very much for inviting me onto the show it's a pleasure to, to talk to you and and 
to all the people who uh, watch this podcast. Um, and uh, it was really no problem to postpone my week. I was also a little under the weather last week. So hopefully both of us are feeling a bit better <laughs> today. Um, yeah, de deterrence is a, is a funny concept because, you know, I'm, I'm an academic with a PhD in, in political science and there's a whole academic discipline of international relations, uh, which is full of specialized, you know, theoretical jargon. And a lot of the words that, that people in, in IR like me talk about, you know, if you went you know, outside of uh, our, our ivory tower and you talk to ordinary people on the street, they would have no idea what those words meant. Um, I sometimes don't like to use the term, you know, epistemic community, which was kind of a buzzword, you know, well, right, ten, description. right, right. You know, 10, 20 years ago, we know what it means, but but most people do not. It, it, it means a sort of expert policy community. And, and frankly, they're the ones who've actually elected Donald Trump. So there you are. Yes, 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 exactly. But, but you know, deterrence, Everybody knows that word, right? Deterrence yeah. is a word that we use in ordinary language. And I think everybody feels like they have an intuitive understanding of what it means. You know, threaten to do something really bad uh, and hurtful to, to persuade somebody else not to do something that would be, you know, harmful to you. Um, so, you know, we all know the word, you know, we're all familiar with it. Um, in practice, many people today associate deterrence specifically with nuclear weapons, uh, but that's that's not really accurate, right? Deterrence right. has been around since long before nuclear weapons were invented. Um, uh, the, yeah, the term Professor, Professor Mersheimer had his first book, which was his uh, doctoral thesis on conventional deterrence. On conventional deterrence, exactly. And, and the term itself was invented by people who were concerned about crime prevention, right? Let's deter Precise. people from committing crimes. So, you know, deterrence means a lot more things than nuclear weapons. And, and conversely, there are people who have advocated for nuclear strategies that would use nuclear weapons for, for more purposes than uh, deterrence. Um, that said, the world has a very big stake in nuclear deterrence per se, right? Uh, we have nine countries today that have uh, nuclear arsenals, um, all nine more or less posture them for purposes of uh, deterrence. Um, and everybody in the world has a stake in how's this gonna turn out, right? Will this continue to work? Uh, will deterrence continue to be effective? Will deterrence relationships stay stable? You know, or, or could something go wrong in the future? And, and you did a brilliant job, um, you know, summarizing the incident from the, the Cuban Missile Crisis where it was really a, a coincidence that this uh, 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 Arkhipov was on that particular Soviet submarine because there were there were multiple subs that had been deployed, uh, you know, off the shores of uh, Cuba. Um, and if he'd been assigned to a different submarine, he wouldn't have been there to talk his commanding officer, you know, out of a decision to launch a nuclear weapon. Uh, and the reason that Arkhipov did this was that he had some prior experience with. Um, the dangers of radiation. Um, uh, Soviet uh, uh, nuclear um, naval uh, construction wasn't um, very safe in those days. So he had previously been deployed on a, a, a ship where there had been a, a, a propulsion reactor uh, accident and some crew members in order to sort of fix it and save the ship were exposed to lethal doses of radiation and, and they had died. So Arkhipov had a personal familiarity with nuclear dangers that other members of the crew did not. And that seems to have motivated him to try to talk his commanding officer, you know, out of a decision to launch. So, you know, the, the big picture story of the Cuban Missile Crisis is, you know, President John F. Kennedy sat down and gathered this group of advisors called the XCOM, and they very carefully deliberated all their options, and they prudently picked a middle course. Uh, and when the crisis got really dangerous, you know, he made a decision that it was more important to avoid you know, nuclear war than it was to impose some, you know, humiliating uh, defeat on the Soviet Union and, and Kennedy and Khrushchev uh, negotiated what was basically a, a diplomatic, you know, compromise. That all looks very rational, but we now see that underneath the surface, right, things can go wrong, right, unexpected events uh, and, um, you know, luck potentially is playing a very, uh, you know, big role in what happens. Um, 
so so uh, I could probably keep talking at length, but uh, but let me yeah, let you I, ask I, some more questions. Because, yeah, I, I no no I actually want the story to unfold, as I said, mostly for the informed journalists. But I have a story to tell you. Okay, just to position this. So I used to be the pugwash, uh, you know, the the national coordinator for the national pugwash chapter. And in that capacity, uh, back in uh, 2000, I had gone to Delhi for a for a pug wash mm -hmm. round table. Mm -hmm. And Bob McNamara had become a fixture on the pug wash circuit. So we were there, and of course, this is 2000, and in 98, India had tested, Pakistan had tested. So yeah. you know, we guys were we were like the new kids of the block. And so we were talking about we were basically throwing back at the, the Americans and the Brits, the nuclear strategy theories. And so when my time came, I also, you know, basically said what I had to say. And then we had that session over. There was a tea recess and I was pouring myself tea and I see Bob McNamara walk up to me. And I'm telling you this because I've actually written about this. So he walks up to me, introduces himself. So I say, sir, you know, you don't have to introduce yourself. Everyone knows who you are. He said, young man, you know, you know your nuclear strategy, but I have to tell you something. And I said, sir, what's that? Everything that you have said is bullshit. <laughs> and that actually started a, a very uh, important chapter in my life because over the next eight to nine years uh, on the Pugwatch circuit. And then I invited uh, Bob. I convened a conference in Lahore, invited him over to my house. The insights that I got from him on the Cold War, on nuclear strategy, on the Cuban Missile Crisis and the rest of it were just incredible. And so when I watched that documentary by L. Morris, uh, the fog of war, 11 lessons mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. life of Robert Strain McNamara. And the first lesson is about empathy. And I discussed it with him. I mean, so Khrushchev sends two letters. Tommy Thompson says, and you know, you know how we've just mentioned, I, I mentioned XCOM in my opening. You just mentioned XCOM. And you know how the military chiefs were behaving, especially Curtis LeMay. And, and they had their own view of, you know, taking a mm -hmm. forceful uh, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, front foot action against uh, Cuba. And Thompson was the one who said, listen, he, he wants a face saver. And so you have to give him the face. So focus on the soft letter, not the hard letter. And it was, uh, and again, leaving aside the archive of incident, what was happening on the surface uh, Kennedy understood this. I mean, I I was, uh, uh, you know, as Graham Allison has also written about how JFK just two months ago was reading Barbara Tuckman's mm -hmm. The Guns of Focus mm -hmm. and basically never wanted to, to commit those mistakes uh, that would sleepwalk him into a crisis, although he did. During the 13 days, he did commit many mistakes which could have gone this way or that way. But it, it's a fascinating because you know, deterrence holds until it fails. And I was this uh, this this paper that uh, your still unpublished paper, which I, I'm assuming is going through peer review and the rest of it. I was fascinated because you talked about, and we'll come to that. You talked about these thousand, you know, Earth experiments, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one can just simply do these experiments through various crises that you also mention in the paper. And each one of those could have gone somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I was uh, very fascinated by uh, where you end the paper in terms of civil society action, in terms of sending out a message to the political leaders and to essentially figure out a way of moving outside of the clubs Mm -hmm. uh, conventional wisdom and to say, look, this can happen because if you mm -hmm. play it out mm -hmm. over a longer trajectory, you have no way of not knowing that this is not going to happen. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, so in, in, in uh, an earlier 
a stage of my career, I wrote an article um, about nuclear learning and, and what does the concept of nuclear learning really mean? Um, and a little bit ironically, actually, I think the people who cite that paper far and away the most are scholars from India and Pakistan, um, yeah. who, to my mind, maybe misuse it a little bit to sort of say, look, my country has learned how to handle nuclear weapons responsibly. We had our nuclear learning, so now you could let us into the nuclear club, um, which, which that was not my intended um, message in the paper. Um, that's an occupational hazard every yes, time. Yes. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. Just, you know, spell my name correctly. <laughs> Put me in a footnote. Yeah. I'm happy. <laughs> um, but you, you mentioned earlier sort of your own personal migration from being sort of a deterrence optimist to more of a deterrence skeptic. Uh, the people in, in our field who, who are deterrence optimists um, assume that there's something about nuclear weapons that automatically produces stability. You know, just because nuclear weapons exist, the, the implications of nuclear weapons should somehow be blindingly obvious to everybody and uh, their material uh, uh, consequences of detonating them uh, leads everybody automatically to an assumption that we have to behave in certain ways that take away the danger of nuclear escalation. Right? And the point I was, I was trying to make was kind of a simple one, which is we're not born you know, with like inherited knowledge of this is what nuclear weapons do uh, and this is how the reality of nuclear weapons requires us to behave, right? It's a learning process, right? Partly you take in factual information. These are the consequences if there's a nuclear war, uh, but partly there's a larger set of inferences that you have to draw in connection with that factual information. And because of the danger of nuclear war, therefore, you know, I should avoid arms racing. I should avoid first strike capabilities. Um, I should, you know, I should try to de-escalate crises and so forth. Um, but in practice, not everybody draws those particular lessons. So you mentioned the fact that Kennedy, you know, and, and we know this is true of Khrushchev as well. They had advisors around the table with them that drew different lessons. And they were like, now's the time to, to kill off our enemy, you know, launch first, get it over with. Right. So if somebody else, you know, had been in the president's chair or the, the general secretary's chair, they might have made a different uh, decision there. What they learned was different from what Kennedy and Khrushchev learned. And so, um, you know, two things in, in this were very important. You know, one was what were the particular lessons they learned? And very fortunately for the world, both Kennedy and Khrushchev had learned uh, lessons that pointed them in the direction of, of caution, of prudence, of uh, the, the need to avoid nuclear escalation. But just as important, there was two of them, right? This was a shared set of lessons. If only one side's leader thought that way and the other side's leader did not, right, we might get a very, very different outcome. So, so nuclear learning has to lead to certain kinds of lessons about the need to act carefully, and it has to be shared across all of the relevant, you know, leaders, you know, who have their their finger on the nuclear uh, button. Um, now, if I can, can elaborate on that point, uh, even that doesn't, you know, that helps, right? That, that, that maximizes our chances of survival, but, but it doesn't guarantee it. Um, we have very fortunately, you know, we're now almost 80 years uh, since the, the United States dropped at, atomic bombs on the, the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. And many people were quite pessimistic about the world's ability to survive the nuclear age that, that you know, they thought a nuclear World War III was in, inevitable. Um, you know, now that we've gone 80 years, it, it's possible to be very, very optimistic and say, well, you know, if nobody has really used a nuclear weapon in all this time, deterrence must be perfect, right? It must be, it must be infallible. It must, it must be safe. And we can be complacent. We can be relaxed. You know, and, and the, the unpublished paper that you've mentioned, um, you know, makes the point that we are overconfident about this, that, that this complacency um, is not actually justified by the, the historical evidence, the empirical evidence that we have available. We're, we're, we're reading too much into this 80 years of history. And so I make a kind of philosophical, you know, epistemological argument uh, about why we shouldn't be so confident, and, and as, as you briefly mentioned, I, um, uh, I illustrate this with a thought experiment, right? So 
none of us knows what is the percentage probability that nuclear deterrence might fail and, and we get a nuclear war. You know, maybe it's uh, in any given 80 year period, since that's what we've lived through, you know, maybe it was 5%, maybe it was 10%, maybe it was 20%, maybe it was a 50 50 call, right? Um, you know, and we're just lucky that we're living in the, the world where we're in the non nuclear war percentage of, of that, you know, without knowing what was our level of risk, um, you know, over the last 80 years. Um, and deterrence optimists, you know, say, well, no, you know, actors are rational, nuclear weapons are powerful. Um, I have a theory that predicts there'll never be a nuclear war. And so look, we've gone 80 years, my theory is, is supported by the evidence. But if this is a, a probability thing, there's a certain level of risk and we don't know, but with, there's uncertainty, uh, you know, along with that risk, we don't know what the actual percentage probability of nuclear deterrence failure is. Um, we need a lot more data, right? 80 years of earth history, where it is not enough data. And so one way to think about that is imagine that we somehow had godlike powers, right? And, and we could experiment with planet earth and we could turn back the clock and reset the clock to 1945 and hit a start button and we can rerun earth history since 1945 to the present, right? And we can do this in multiple different trials of earth history, right? There's no guarantee that, that over the next 80 years, all of those different alternative earth histories turn out the same way, right? Maybe Arkhipov is in a different submarine somewhere. Um, maybe Khrushchev has already been removed from power and somebody else is in control of the Politburo, right? There's so many things that, um, you know, could have gone wrong. Um, so maybe, maybe JFK thinks that Curtis Lemay is right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Argument, but, exactly. Know. Or, or he makes a calculation that, that, you know, he's got a tough presidential election coming up in 1964. And if voters think he was soft on Cuba, he'll be defeated. And he puts his domestic political interests ahead of the fate of the earth. Right. Which you is, just do that. Exactly, <laughs> at one point, which is exactly what Lemaire tells him, that you have been saying that you're going to be tough on this. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so, so now, that the, now that the moment has arrived, you've got to be tough on this. Yeah. So, so imagine that we could, could run experiments with Earth and we could run a thousand versions of Earth history since 1945. Then we would start to fill in the probability estimates. Maybe in 200 out of a thousand Earth trials, a nuclear war happens. And then we can say, okay, well, there was a 20% chance of nuclear war. And so far we've been lucky. But if we go another, you know, 80 years and another 80 years past that, right, the odds keep turning more and more uh, yeah. against us, right? And we're, we're, we're running a risk that is, is eventually going to accumulate up uh, and bite us one day. Which is where I want to come to another very nuanced point that you make, uh, which is... Uh, the fact that you know we should not conflate risk with uncertainty and i think that is a very important point because risk uh, can be calculated mm -hmm. uh, militaries constantly do that uh, political leaders constantly do that you have different courses of action you say okay like the military does it says it's going to go go in for this operation these are the odds. These are the number of casualties they're going to have. So you can, in a, of course, your calculation may go awry. That's a, that's a separate issue altogether. But you can begin. But uncertainty, as you mentioned, and which is where it becomes so nuanced and sophisticated, is the fact you cannot really work it out. Exactly. Exactly. So we, we talk, you know, the language we use is we talk about the risk of nuclear war as if it is a risk situation. Right. And, and the technical definition of risk is that there's some percentage chance that a bad thing could happen, but we have adequate data to calculate that. So the whole insurance industry is based on this, right? When somebody gives you a policy to cover your car, right, they can calculate the percentage chance that you're going to have a car crash and they have to pay for repairs and they, they can set their premiums at, at a level where they still make a profit, right? Yeah. We don't have the data you know, to do that with nuclear weapons. So what we really have is an uncertainty situation. There's some chance that things could go wrong and nuclear weapons get used, but we don't know the, the percentage probability of that. Um, but, 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 but equally important, we also don't know what is the, the circumstances or what is the, what is the scenario that makes nuclear use most likely. So, so 
you actually have interacting problems. You have a problem of uncertainty, but then that's compounded by a second problem of, of trade-offs. So different yeah. people have different theories of how, how nuclear war might happen, right? And we can simplify it by saying there's two basic theories, right? There's sort of a deterrence model, which says, you know, if a nuclear war happens, it's going to be because somebody's deterrent posture was, was too weak and it lacked credibility. They didn't have enough weapons. They didn't demonstrate their toughness and resolve. Right? And the other side makes a deliberate decision to escalate because they think the other, the, their opponent is weak. Right? But there's an alternative theory out there, which is more one of kind of accidental or, or inadvertent escalation. Right, the, In the fog of a crisis, uh, people misperceive, false warnings come in, computers fail, they don't understand what's going on, uh, and they think that they've been pushed into a situation that requires them to, to use nuclear weapons or... Um, Nuclear use is pre-delegated down the chain of command and some rogue colonel, you know, pushes the button, right? And war kind of happens by accident, right? It was not planned or deliberate or intentional by anybody, right? Those are both believable, plausible scenarios. Like, I, I can imagine cases in which either of those could happen. But the, the problem is that the policy recommendations of those two alternatives are completely opposed to each other, right? So if you're somebody, the only thing you ever think about is, could my deterrent fail? It pushes you towards a whole set of fairly hardline policies. You know, I need to build up more weapons, right? I need to have uh, sophisticated early warning systems. You know, I need to have uh, launch on alert, uh, you know, hair trigger launch policies. Uh, I need to talk tough and threaten the other side all the time. I need to never back down in a crisis. But if you're worried about the more kind of accidental, you know, inadvertent path to escalation, those are all the wrong things to do. Right, those leave the other side feeling more threatened, more insecure, uh, more that it's being put in a use them or lose them situation where maybe they have to launch first, right? And so, uh, the problem of uh, the problem of uncertainty, interacts with the problem of trade offs. Not only do we not know what's the the probability that a nuclear war might happen, but if both of those two scenarios are possible, we don't know which of those two is more likely. You know, so if you you know you if, you. You centralize them, you may fail impotent. You exactly, exactly. Them, you may fail deadly. Exactly. I mean, going back to this, this Cuban Missile Crisis thing, so JFK had raised it to DEFCON 2, and then the protocols were that, frankly, within DEFCON 2, some Turkish or German pilot could have gotten in, and you didn't have electronic locks at that time. They could have gone, dropped a bomb somewhere on the Soviet Union and returned, and that could have resulted in World War III. So the point really is that, which is what has now increasingly a deterrent skeptic or route to being a deterrent pessimist. Uh, I, I do believe that the, the, com the complacency uh, that has actually set in uh, within the club uh, and this complacency, obviously, is uh, basically begotten of the fact that we've got the entire jargon, we've got our mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, of it, mm -hmm. and since nothing has happened since Nagasaki and Hiroshima, nothing is ever going to happen, mm -hmm. uh, which is something which uh, statistically uh, is not possible. I mean, Correct. if you even if you even if you discount the the, the rational sort of decision by a leader to actually start a nuclear war. Uh, going by Charles Perrault's, for instance, framework of, uh, uh, of you know, accidents in, in, in uh, complex systems, something can happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there are organizations, things like Scott Second and others have written about. Um, and uh, uh, now, of course, we are getting into a situation where, frankly, uh, there are these existential wars going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, the mm -hmm. sense that there is an existential thing. And so if one uses James Fearon's, uh, you know, uh, concept of the issue in divisibilities, where you really don't have too many, uh, you know, uh, uh, off ramps, and it's something where, where leaders are going to go to war instead of, staying away from it because they realize ex ante that it's going to be costly. So, which is why I, I, I think uh, your article is so spot on because it has to be 
uh, looked at in the backdrop of what's happening, uh, whether in, in, in Gaza and Lebanon, whether uh, the Russo-Ukraine war, whether the peer competition between the United States and, and, uh, and China, um, we really are at a stage where the situation already, I mean, the distrust is so much mm -hmm. that the possibility of conflict escalation uh, becomes uh, very high. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, let me say first that um, I hope I have some peer reviewers for my paper who agree with you and, and recommend publishing it. I'd love to see it uh, come out. Um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm quite sold on it, so. <laughs> good, good. I, well, I appreciate I picked, that. I picked, up, I picked up a couple of typos, but apart from that, there was... <laughs> um, yeah. You know, the, the, in, in debates about nuclear policy, uh, people who are advocates for you know nuclear disarmament or, or global zero often get accused of being idealists or, or utopians, and it's the supporters of nuclear deterrence who say we're the realists here. But but I think it's actually quite utopian to believe that we could keep nuclear weapons forever and they'll never be used. I mean that seems to me Thank to be the you. ultimate version of idealism. Like that's, it's just, a, that's, it's just, a great, that's a great argument. Yeah, it's just not realistic, right? At some point they're going to be used, and and we don't know how far it will escalate. We don't know how many people will kill. We killed. We don't know if we'll cross the threshold to, to nuclear winter, but but we're run, we're running a risk of something yeah. earth earth ending, civilization ending, you know, happening. Um, so you know, I, I really liked the way you, you put it earlier in the show. I'm not, uh, my friends um, on the kind of pro disarmament side um, sometimes feel that rhetorically they have to tear down nuclear deterrence, that they have to say, oh, deterrence is a myth. It never works. Um, it's a, 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 you know, a, 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 a sort of like a, a mental illness or, or a bizarre way of thinking. Right? And, and I don't think that. I actually think deterrence is, is quite effective right and quite powerful um yeah. but but i would put it the way that you did which is it works until it doesn't right it's it's it does a lot of things quite well but it doesn't do them with a 100 percent guarantee it does them with a, an unknown level of risk absolutely it's not a panacea you know we we have actually begun to and you know i am kind of i'm not an academic but in a sort of quasi sort of you know part of being the being the club i i've gone through over the last 20 years all these arguments. But one thing that, uh, that really struck me at one point, and this is again with reference to what you wrote, uh, you know, Salvador de Madriaga, who was once the chairman of the League of Nations Disarmament Commission, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he said something very interesting. He said, listen, the direction of causality is wrong. You see, nations don't distrust each other because they're armed. They are armed because they distrust each other. So therefore, you have to first get the, the, you know, the direction of causality right and then begin to figure out how to begin to disarm. And so therefore, before you begin to disarm, you have to begin, begin to build trust. Yeah. And that is the problem right now because trust is in very short supply. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, to, to me, this is really the hardest question. I, you know, I'll, I'll put my cards on the table. I, I am a nuclear disarmament advocate. I, I because I don't believe that we can survive forever with no nuclear war, I think we have to find a path to effectively uh, abolish nuclear weapons that can be sufficiently verified and, and enforced and that most countries, you know, will, will self-enforce because they view it as being in their self-interest. Um, but it's very, very hard to see how we get from the world of 2024 to a world where this becomes possible and, and you know, to... Two or three things that are very big, you know, all have to change, right? One is we need a world that's less conflictual, right? Where, where uh, great power rivalry is not as intense, you know, as it is today. And, and for whatever differences of ideology and political system we have, we're more or less willing to live and let live. Um, countries are still going to have defense needs. So, you know, we need some alternatives for nuclear deterrence that countries are willing to, to believe in and say, yes, my, my national security needs can be sufficiently protected with, you know, these other kinds of defense capabilities that, you know, that don't require nuclear weapons. Um, and we probably need some advances in, in verification, you know, enough, 
enough to make people comfortable that other people aren't cheating. Um, you know, I hope that all of those are doable, but but it's a really that's a very challenging menu. It's going to be a very tall order to get there. But I want to further problematize this. Uh, see, with with these emerging technologies where we are introducing artificial intelligence into kill chains and decision making, uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is the entanglement of conventional nuclear forces mm -hmm. and of course, the mm -hmm. fact that you now have these non-nuclear non strategic uh, weapons and platforms. And recently, one of the questions that I've been putting to various experts uh, is, a, is a simple one. I say, okay, and I, I use the example of, of the Russo-Ukraine war because mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is, you have a nuclear weapon state on the one side and you have a non-nuclear weapon mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. But that, given the you know non-nuclear strategic uh, weapon systems and platforms, uh, the deterrence calculus becomes really complicated uh, for a nuclear weapon state if, uh, if it is in a conflict with a non-nuclear weapon state and the non-nuclear weapon state is actually using a non-nuclear strategic weapon to take out a nuclear asset. Mm -hmm. How is the nuclear weapon state going to respond to that? Is, is this going to be an... And I really want to put it within the sort of, you know, the, the statements that uh, President Putin has been making in terms of the new nuclear postures mm -hmm. of Russia. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, I'll send you, some, unless you picked it up uh, already, yesterday uh, on 7th November, he was uh, in Sochi at the Valdai uh, Discussion Club and he delivered the keynote address and uh, he's talked about why he has gone into Ukraine. Of course, he's got his own point of view and the rest of it. But a lot of what he's saying is something that you that cannot be denied because it's factual. And a number of experts, even within the United States, have actually talked about the fact starting back in the 90s about NATO expansion and mm -hmm. the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my point is that uh, th th this whole idea of the, the you know, getting the deterrence calculus getting complicated is yet another problem uh, which we haven't really looked into. That, that's right. So so we, we like to simplify things. That's kind of a strong, you know, human tendency. And uh, going back to sort of the, the, the deterrence optimists, you know, they like to simplify, simplify things a lot. You know, nuclear weapons are so powerful and so destructive that the implications are really obvious and the implications are that you should should never use them right? and, and everybody will see that um and there's many many different ways in which that might turn out not to be true right and so we talked about yeah. loss of control over events and not realizing what subordinates you know are doing like the the soviet submarine example we talked about um you know what happened in the past might not be predictive of the future because things that were true in the past are not true in the future. What happens when we introduce um, uh, cyber attack modes? What happens when we introduce artificial intelligence? You know, what happens when we introduce uh, uh, satellite-based global positioning systems that are vulnerable to anti-satellite attacks, right? So what was true from 1945 to, to 2024, um, it'll be a different world of technology a different world of geopolitics in the future. And so the, the patterns we saw in the past might not forecast the future. And so we're, we're not just uncertain about how lucky we are, but it's a, it's a more radical form of uncertain uncertainty. We're uncertain about how the future might be different from you know, uh, the past. Uh, and, and then the, the final point I'll make is um, we have some very, very powerful evidence from psychology, behavioral economics, brain science about what real human decision making is like, right? And it's, it's quite clear now that, that actual human beings don't think, don't calculate, don't make decisions, anything like what the, the rational actor model on paper yeah. you know, yeah. tells us, right, right. So there's there's various kinds of, of biases that can introduce, you know, misperception and miscalculation, but but equally important, it, it's become quite, quite clear that our emotions matter a lot, right? And, and emotions and rationality yeah. are actually tangled up with each other in complicated ways. We can't, you know, we can't be like the character Mr. Spock on Star Trek where we just control all our emotions and we just make rational decisions. They're 
all jumbled up together all the time. Yeah, because we are not we are not Klingons, so exactly we're not Klingons um, yeah. um, or Vulcans. Um, uh, and somebody like Vladimir Putin, you know, I look at him, and and I think this is true of all leaders, but we can you know we can use Putin as an example. There's all sorts of things around national pride, status, uh, respect um, that that matter a great deal to him, right? And so when somebody like, like Vladimir Putin complains about NATO expansion, partly it's a security calculation. It's harder for Russia to defend itself if the other alliance marches up to its borders. Um, that's true, right? But it's also, I think, a Russian status thing. Like when the Soviet Union existed, it achieved equal status with the United States. There were two equal superpowers who were pure competitors, competitors, and they treated each other with a certain level of respect, right? Nuclear arms control talks showed that the United States regarded the Soviet Union as an equal you know, partner in, in determining the future of the world. Right? And Russia lost so much status right after the, the Soviet Union collapsed and multiple successive US presidents showed, I think, a certain amount of disrespect or disdain for Russia. They treated it as a yeah. failed state, a declining power, a, less, a lesser player, right? And, and there's a, an anger, there's a resentment uh, about that where, you know, we hope that Vladimir Putin will say, well, using any nuclear weapon in Ukraine opens a Pandora's box to future escalation and we don't know what will happen and the cost-benefit calculation is not favorable. Right. But he might act out of pride. He might act out of anger. Right. He might act out of an emotion, emotional impulse of the moment because he thinks Russia's status and him is sort of the, the you know, uh, um, the sort of uh, manifestation of the Russian state is being disrespected. And he feels the need to lash out, you know, out of anger. Right. That's a different situation that makes the risks, you know, again, higher. Yeah, he, he actually denotes, I mean, he has a civilizational concept, which is historically correct. Um, I, For instance, uh, when I meet with the, with Chinese uh, scholars and experts, and, you know, over the last seven, eight, ten years, one of the things that I constantly come across is that the, the whole idea of a century of humiliation is so deeply ingrained. Yes, yes. yes. And it informs present decisions. And I think that is something, and I know that you, you, you've been working on the behave, behavioral aspects of, of uh, decision making, the rest of it. But here's the thing, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you go, if you go back to Kahneman's and Tversky's work about you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. fast, slow thinking, most of us uh, work on the basis of heuristics. And mm -hmm. I, at, at one level, it is absolutely uh, good because you know, we've got the muscle memory and we can yeah. immediately yeah. respond to yeah. us, stimulus. But then there are situations where you have to actually begin to, edit that. I've, I've actually seen this with myself, and I realize how difficult it is for me to somehow consciously set aside my predispositions and try and begin to look at a situation completely anew. Yep. And even then, I'm not sure that my, my predispositions are not coming into play into this. Yeah, so, that, so that's exactly right. And, and, and it's even worse because not only do you have to try to put a stop to the fast thinking part of decision-making and, and switch to slow thinking, but you also have to try to understand how is the other side perceiving their situation? How are they yeah. thinking, right? So even yeah, if you, absolutely. right, even if you understand yourself well, you may not understand the other side and then they have to understand you. Right. And so it's the, the complications build up very, you know, very quickly. And, and that's what I, I mentioned Aaron Morris's documentary on, uh, on uh, McNamara. And the first lesson is empathize with the enemy. Yes. Yes. And so you have to put yourself and I have actually, uh, this was years ago. I was uh, in DC speaking at one of the think tanks. And so there was this whole Iran thing. And I, I said to my interlocutor, I said, listen, why don't you, for a moment, place yourself in Tehran and look at the United States and see how Tehran perceives a threat from the United States? Because you're constantly talking about the Iranian threat, but you seem to either completely ignore or not prepared to look at the fact that the Iranians perceive 
a clear and, and clear and present threat from the United States. I mean, this can be said about a number of other dyads, mm -hmm. uh, conflict mm -hmm. dyads. So I think that lesson about empathizing with the enemy is extremely important. But I also think, as you also uh, seem to uh, think, that it's, it's it's the most difficult thing to do. It's really hard. Yeah, there is um, a former colleague of mine before before I was at the Middlebury Institute. I taught at the Naval Postgraduate School, um, also in Monterey. Uh, and I had a, a colleague there uh, named Zachary Shore, uh, who's written a book about what he calls strategic empathy that, yeah. that tries to make that case about how important it is to try to understand how the other side sees the world and, and, and how hard um, it is. So, you know, any you or any of your, your viewers who are interested in that concept of, of uh, strategic uh, empathy, I would um, direct you to Professor Shore's uh, book. But I also had some colleagues um, at our Center for Nonproliferation uh, Studies um, apply the concept of strategic empathy to try to figure out how um, countries make decisions about weapons acquisition and weapons use and did case studies of uh, North Korea uh, and Iran uh, and Russia. So I actually don't know how much of that they've published yet or not, but if you go to the CNS uh, website, nonproliferation.org, you could see if there's a link. I'll, it was, I'll definitely do that. Yeah, it was, it was um, Sarah Bidgood, uh, Jim Lamson and, and Sig Hecker were the, the co-authors and um, really tried to sort of achieve strategic empathy and, and understand how the other side thinks. And, and you know, one of the points that they make that's really important is that empathy and, and sympathy are not the same things, right? Yeah. So you can, you can empathize with and understand the other side. That doesn't mean that you're approving of it or justifying it. Yeah. You're saying, like, I just have to understand how they think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. But it was great talking to you, Jeff. Um, Likewise. Ho hopefully, uh, we'll have uh, more occasions to uh, to talk about these things. But uh, it's it's uh, I, I'm I'm so happy because I was really looking forward to this, and especially after reading that paper, I thought, here's my man. I need to speak with him, <laughs> and and so there you are. Well, I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you um, so much for in, inviting me on. And it's you know I always have um. A, a weird mental conflict in my head because the subject we're talking about is is potentially the, the end of the earth, right? Which seems like a you know it seems like a weird thing to enjoy talking about that, but it's it's yeah. it's important, but it's also really interesting, and I'm I'm always happy to have these yeah, conversations. But I I I, I want to end it with what uh, JFK said to Dave Powers about the the brass, and uh, he said these brass hats have one great advantage in their favor. If we listen to them and do what they want us to do, none of us will be alive later to tell them that they were wrong. Yes, so, exactly. <laughs> so, so there you are. Anyway, thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, this is all from this episode. If you like the discussion, click on the subscribe button. And frankly, it doesn't give, get me any lucre, but it certainly makes me very happy. And it also helps us bring you quality discussions. Until our next episode, goodbye and stay safe.